Eh, buenos días, buenas tardes más bien, ya pasan de las 12. Eh, miren, es, es un gusto para mí, para el Departamento de Computación, tener como invitado aquí a, a Miguel Ángel Sánchez Pérez. Él viene de Oracle, eh, del campus que tiene Oracle, bueno, pues, sí si es que un campus, un campus, un campus que tiene ahí en Zapopan, eh, conurbado a Guadalajara, en Jalisco. Eh, nos va a platicar sobre este trabajo que desarrolla él en Oracle, que tiene mucho de, de investigación. Eh, Miguel es egresado el doctorado en, en julio de 2018 aquí en el Centro de, de Investigación en Computación del Politécnico. Eh, hizo la maestría también allí. Hizo la licenciatura en la Escuela Superior de Cómputo del Politécnico, siempre con las mejores notas, o sea, desde los de los chicos estrella de su generación y bueno pues este eh, ella es dulce ella es reclutadora de Oracle o sea que si ustedes tienen interés en, en seguir una, un desarrollo parecido al que tiene Miguel que yo lo encuentro sumamente valioso o sea que es ver cómo egresados de, de centros de investigación del mejor nivel en México pueden desarrollarse eh, de una manera profesional muy plena en la industria, ¿no? o sea, fortalecer ese vínculo academia, empresa, industria y del mejor nivel a nivel mundial, creo que es una cosa muy valiosa y en ese sentido eh, tener aquí a Miguel tiene ese enorme valor. Y bueno, pues a los interesados aquí está con quien dirigirse, ¿de acuerdo? Pues un aplauso para los Miguel. Bueno, voy a cambiar a, a inglés porque es un, es un requisito de Oracle. Y a veces es más fácil explicar algunas partes, algunos detalles técnicos relacionados. So, oh, I'm Dr. Miguel Ángel Sánchez Pérez, uh, Dr. Matías already did a nice introduction. I'm going to talk about how we find duplicate box at Oracle. Oracle is a huge company with uh, almost 1,000 products. Each one of these products have problems, usually. And uh, for Oracle, it's paramount to find duplicate box soon, so developers can solve these problems, these issues fast. This represents a million of dollars to Oracle. If we find this fast and we solve this problem fast, given all the commitments Oracle has to, uh, to his clients and the reputation Oracle holds with them. So we're going to talk about a bit about this project, but before we're going to do a little bit of promotion about Oracle, what is uh, my team, uh, how we live there. So this is a safe harbor statement, it's like a requirement, like everything I say here is just uh, informative, it's not a, a promise of a, any product or anything like that. So it's just an informal talk about uh, something like what we do there. So the outline of this presentation first is who we are, our life as part of Oracle. Uh, we're going to talk about a bit of our uh, introduction to our project that is a uh, called adaptive box search and then uh, the technical part, the main part of, of this presentation is going to be the BERT model, that is a deep learning model very popular right now in natural language processing tasks and then a bit of uh, how to join Oracle, some information if you are interested in uh, being part of Oracle after you finish or sometimes when you are uh, in the last part of your, your um, project, you can go to Oracle six months, one year, to do an internship there. So you, you start getting familiarized with uh, how the industry works. Hey, uh, uh, how do you define what is a duplicate bug? A duplicate bug is a kind of similar problem that we okay. solve uh, in okay. it's not the same, it's similar way. Find two, two times the same bug. Exactly. Well, it's sometimes not necessarily the same, but they have plenty of similarities. Okay. And at the end, this is a, at Oracle, we have a database of bugs, and this database has sometimes is like a, a taxonomy. Sometimes okay. there are relations between these bugs, and these relations are labeled manually by developers. Okay. So okay. somebody submitted a bug, and after a few weeks of iteration, they say, oh, this is some bug I saw before, tag it as a duplicate. Okay. So we, we have a labeled data set in that sense, like it's millions of bugs. You know? I think in the last 10 years we might have like a 10 million duplicate bugs. So we have a, a lot of data, that's one of the advantages of the industry sometimes. We have uh, data and we have real data, but uh, 
it comes with plenty of challenges too. So who we are? Well, we are called the Adaptive Box Search Team, and we are four in Me uh, we are four in Guadalajara. This guy is from Tech de Monterrey. He's a, an engineer from Tech de Monterrey, Monterrey. This is uh, from SCOM. This guy is a master's degree from UNAM. And well, I'm here from Politecnico, at the end of the PhD from Politecnico. And this tall guy here is a boss in Guadalajara that he was visiting in California. We, we are half in Zapopan, half in, in California. He's our local boss. And these ladies are engineers. They are like a, one from Singapore. This lady is origin from China, but uh, she was born in, in Pennsylvania. And this is our project manager. He's like an architect as well, which is quite important. Super cool guy is called Samir from India, from, from India, Virginia. So we are a very like a heterogeneous team. That's why it's so important to speak English because uh, there is no other way to, to communicate. So our life at, as part of Oracle, well, <coughs> we regularly, at least one or twice a year, we have meetings. So sometimes we need to fly to California, and uh, we have fun with the team. We do some uh, team building activities and so on. We also do this kind of visit to like, uh, plan our strategy more into detail, what we plan to do uh, for this project, some guidelines and, and so on. But uh, we also have plenty, plenty of fun there. And uh, other things we try to do is to keep uh, updated all the time. So during that visit we also were able to attend a poster session at Stanford from students of uh, engineering bachelor degree. The, from second, third year, they are already working. They are already working on the machine learning, and uh, we attend the poster of these classes like deep learning, applied machine learning, and natural language processing. Like I mean, the principal professors here. You can see this is Andrew Ng. This is like a quite popular. He's co-founder of uh, Coursera, and he's like an eminence in, in this area of uh, online courses. And this is Christopher Manning. He's also quite important in natural language processing. He's the author of a foundation of a statistical natural language processing. There is a textbook very important for people doing natural language processing. And uh, this is just a bit of promotion. Here is me with Andrew and G, like a kind of a groupie <coughs> posing for pictures, kind of humiliating myself for a picture. But yeah, it was, it was nice to, to meet him in person. This is Christopher Manning. And well, here we are in Stanford doing some sightseeing to beside the, the poster session. This is one of the main points I see, it's quite important Mexico to update is uh, programs because we see here students from second, uh, third year of a bachelor degree that they, they are doing like, artificial intelligence already. They are doing deep learning, they are using the, the benchmark data sets, they are using the la latest models on deep learning. <coughs> so I, th I think we, we should try to keep up this, this space, to, at least to get closer to them. I'm sure here in Civil Stuff they are really nice uh, research, but we still need to grow more. Not just Civil Stuff, I'm sure Civil Stuff is the like top also at SEEK, but we need more, more research and more uh, relation between academy and uh, industry. <coughs> so this is, I also, in Mavos, I also attended the uh, Oracle Machine Learning Summit, that's part of um, living at Oracle too. Um, they invited me there to California again, and Oracle, all the teams at Oracle presents what they're doing, machine learning regard, and uh, all the infrastructure we have, all the challenges uh, we have, where we are trying to go, our competitors, and, and so on. This is picture is not the highlight of the of the summit, but it was nice to to get a nice car for rental paid by Oracle and uh, doing some sightseeing as well. So that doesn't look part of being part of Oracle. They, they treat you well when you have to, to travel. They didn't pay for this, but uh, just a mid-range car. But when we got there, they gave us a free up, uh, upgrade. So what was nice. This is not the, the, the highlight of the summit, but it's nice. Uh, now a bit of promotion. This is uh, a kind of uh, an idea how Oracle is going to be. Right now we are in Sapopan and we are renting a building. Like we have like nine floors there and we have another two buildings with three or four floors. We are around 1,400 uh, employees. So we have a lot and we don't fit there anymore. So Oracle is building a campus 
has been building a campus since 2015, I think they got the, the, the land. And uh, we are planning to move by the end of this year, so we're going to be there quite soon. And I'm going to show you a video. This is from 2016, so maybe next year, if I come again, I will show you how it looks for real. So. Well, there is no sound, but uh, it's just some relaxing music. This is going to be Oracle next year, basically. We're going to have our own building in one of the nicest places in Zapopan, called Valle Real. I don't know if that's good or bad, because if you want to buy a place there, you have to pay several million pesos, basically. But at least to, to walk around is, is nice. We already selected our places in the building and everything. We have parties too, sometimes. This is uh, November 22nd, we're going to have a kickoff party, like all the employees go there, and. Uh, they, they show what is the strategy for, for next year. Well, that's the new campus we're going to have soon, so probably you should visit. It's going to be super cool. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the part of promotion. Now let's talk about a bit uh, what we do there. So our project is Adaptive Box Search. The motivation is basically improve developer and tester productivity. I mean, if a tester found a duplicate, a, a bug, and it is duplicate, there is no need to submit a new bug. That's it, there's someone working already there. There are other uh, kind of uh, projects that is like a help developers and support analysts identify well, similar proven methods to triage similar issues. I mean, if, if there is a problem that is similar to the problem you have, you can see the solutions they use to solve this uh, problem. And also this point of contact is, we are also working in a project like uh, you give me a bug, I can tell you automatically what is the developer that you need to assign this bug to be solved. This is, there are plenty of uh, engineers involved here right now doing all this uh, work. There are some automat automation, uh, automation there too, but we are working to include more machine learning in this, in this area as well. And then another project that is coming is recommend a patch to a customer. We have a lot of customers using database, Oracle database but they have different uh, versions of the database, and not all of them needs to have the same patch to solve a particular problem they might have. So we might recommend a particular patch for that particular customer to solve that particular bug they have. And uh, with the new Oracle database, as it is called the autonomous database, that almost everything we are talking about here needs to be done automatically. You won't need to have a database administrator to apply a patch and do all this process, Oracle will do this automatically. So that's the motivation. How we do find duplicate bugs? We have a, an input bug, it's a, an engineer or a tester submit a, a bug, there's a report, sometimes they have a structured data, other times it comes with a lot of unstructured data like logs, traces. Imagine your, your database process is writing logs, is whatever is happening is writing a lot of information. Sometimes you need to make a bit of sense uh, that information, besides some structured data, like uh, what version of the database it was, what kind of product, what kind of subcomponent, and, and so on. So we have first that input bug. We have a database of, of uh, bugs that is millions, millions of problems, um, thousands of Oracle products we have there. We do a selection of candidates from that entire database, and then we extract features in both sides and we do kind of pairwise similarity between this input bug and, and these possible candidates. And then we apply, in this case, logistic regression, we get a report. This is like a, the model proposed like five years ago. We are trying to uh, add more uh, deep learning to get this part out, the extraction features, to do the pairwise similarity differently. And even in future stage, to represent a bug as a vector representation, like you do with documents and so on, just to do similarity between the two vector representations of the box. And then you apply 
another layer of multi-layer perception or something like that, and you have a, a classifier to determine if it is duplicate or not. So this is the, like, the general uh, schema of our, of our, pro uh, of our product. <coughs> but one important part is machine learning in real life sometimes is not uh, as we are used to in uh, academia. In academia sometimes you go online, you read some papers and you see there is a benchmark, benchmark data set you download this data set, you create your model, and, and that's it, you test it, you do some cycles there, and, and you publish it. However, in, in industry, it's a bit more complicated, because sometimes you, need, you even have to get, you need, you need to get some legal review of the data you're going to use. You're going to use uh, public data without asking the legal department if you can use this, or a data set uh, provided by another company or another university. So then, after that legal review, you have raw data, you need to probably take just a subsample of this data and uh, do the annotation part, that's one of the hardest parts because sometimes in academia, if you're not creating your own data set, you're using an annotated data, data set already. We are in charge of doing all of that to do the, the crowdsourcing, generating of course guidelines, how, how you do this um, annotation and uh, sometimes you need to compute certain statistics like uh, the agreement between annotators and so on. Uh, probably some of you have been familiar if you have, you have done any data set in your life, you, there is a lot of uh, things to, to follow. And in academia, well, it's, it's something like that. And sometimes we, we have the test data, but we also have the running time data that might be slightly different. So you might need to do some uh, transfer learning between the two data sets. And, so, and sometimes you cannot uh, represent uh, the, your real problem exactly as is presented in real life. You need to come with an abstraction of this problem and get a data set for that problem and so on. I mean, this is uh, machine learning in real life. There is a lot of tasks involved that you are in charge of doing. Nobody is going to do it uh, for you. So in academia, it's more collaboration with other universities and there is more freedom also to use resources uh, provided by other instances. So this is something you need to take into consideration when you are in, in industry. And uh, another point is like, uh, whoa, is like uh, machine learning is not 100% uh, of uh, what we do at Oracle. If you want to, be, uh, to incorporate a machine learning model into industry, you need to make it as part of a system, as part of a service, for instance. And doing that requires also a lot of a lot of effort, a lot of engineers that we do like a configuration of the model, we do data collection that's sometimes related to machine learning, and also the feature extraction if you don't have a deep learning that do it for you everything, and then the other thing related to the resources you are like a training or you are running this in production, because Oracle for instance have a cloud computing like Amazon Web Services, Oracle also has its infrastructure. Well, you need to you need a way to to use this infrastructure. Is uh, some challenges. It's not as uh, easy as put it in your personal computer. You need permissions. You need to make it efficient so you don't uh, like uh, spend uh, you, you don't waste Oracle resources because this is at the end money for for them. And then you need to analyze. You need uh, the serving infrastructure because, for instance, Oracle has the cloud infrastructure and they have data centers in Frankfurt. They have data centers in London. In, Dallas in plenty of places, and our service needs to be working in those data centers specifically. There is not a central server, and they do this for safety reasons. You don't want to take client or customer data out of the data centers they are located. So you put your service in those data centers. So there are a lot of engineering challenges. I'm not in charge of that. I'm more in charge of the part of machine learning. But the rest of the team needs to do a lot of work as well. So this is also like a, what is the machine learning part as part of the entire product we have. Luckily, I'm very glad with that. I'm in charge of this machine learning machine learning part that, that at the end is what I, I did, what I studied um, during my PhD. So now we're going to talk about one of the models we are experimenting with to do one of these uh, pairwise similarity to do, for instance, semantic similarity. You give me two sentences or two box objects, that is one part data point of a bot report, and how we compute similarity between those, these two particular features. 
we are going to talk about these birds. This is this is not part of uh, Oracle. This is a model proposed by Google uh, a couple of years ago that has become like quite popular. So the technical part of this presentation is going to be focused on, on this model that is based on uh, deep learning and is used a lot in national language processing uh, tasks. So the, the overview of this model is well, BERT means to be directional in color representation from transformer. There is a lot of uh, terms here that might uh, sound weird if you have never used NLP and uh, deep learning. Transformer is another architecture we're going to talk about uh, a bit about it. And this is encoder, but well, this transformer is encoder decoder um, approach a model. And they only use encoder for this for this bird. We're going to see a bit more detailed later. Uh, what is bird? Is a method of portraying language representations. I don't know if uh, people here is uh, familiar with uh, word embeddings, for instance, or word to back, where you have a word and you represent this word as a vector, vector of numbers. And then you can use these vectors to do similarity com computations. You, you can compute if you have two vectors, you can compute. Uh, Euclidean distance between them, you can compute the cosine of the angle between these two, these two vectors and you use these metrics as a degree of similarity between representations. So you need to represent words as vectors and then combine a set of words into a representation of a sentence or, or a paragraph. So this is what is called uh, language representations and right now they are the state of the art in every NLP, almost in every NLP task to do machine translation, to do uh, uh, textual entertainment, that means you have a sentence and you need to determine what is the next sentence to come. In uh, language generation, you are giving a sentence and you need to generate something else, or you are giving a, a word and the computer needs to generate a, a sentence out of that uh, input word. All of those uh, models that are used currently are based right now in language representations, at least at the state of the art. And this BERT is one of the most popular ones right now. There are a lot of flavors that goes around it, but uh, this was kind of like a groundbreaking one. There is also well, it's unsupervised pre-training, we're going to talk about a bit what is that, and contextual word embeddings, uh, task-oriented fine-tuning, and state-of-the-art results on a wide array of NLP tasks. I'm going to Describe a bit more is one of these. So on supervised, usually when you have a classifier, you need a uh, label data. You need someone to tell you, given all these features, uh, what is the class. If you are classifying tables, if you are classifying shares, you need somebody to have a few features and then tell you what class is that set of features. That's uh, that's called supervised uh, learning. You need to give them data that is already labeled. But the problem with label data is quite expensive. You need to gather people, tell them how to annotate them, see if they agree on the annotations, and it's quite expensive to get a large amount of data that is labeled. So this model is unsupervised, means you don't have la uh, you don't have label, and this is quite important because there is a lot of uh, unlabeled data set in our uh, environment. There is text everywhere without a proper label, but there is text. text. And uh, what is called labels are the nature of, this, uh, of the text itself. Text was uh, written by humans. So they have some correlation between the context of a word is represented or is defined by the context, words in the same sentence. So it's unsupervised uh, data, but you have uh, some meaning in, in that data. That is, a word is uh, defined by this context. That's one of the principles of a language at the end. So for this model, they use this kind of data. There is some supervised. For instance, they use the, the Wikipedia. You have access to Wikipedia. You can go and download a, a dump of the Wikipedia and train a model like this on that data. And they have some also like an online uh, book uh, data set, like digitalized books. So these are billions, billions of texts that uh, if you wanted to do a supervised learning would be quite expensive to label all these data sets. So this model is trained on this kind of, uh, this kind of 
task. And the objective of this model, given this data set, is the following. There are two. They predict only the masked words. They are given a sentence, and they will mask randomly a certain percentage of those words. For instance, they have this sentence, and they mask this, and they mask this, that belongs to store and garden. And then you will try your model to learn which words are here, like what is the most probable word that will go here and here. So you will learn some deep learning architecture, some neural network that will give each one of these a vector. But when you combine all these words and you try to predict this one here that are masked, you get a representation of these words also. Then then you can do some like vector like a computation between them. That's one of the objectives you try to do. At the end is learn some representation for each one of the words you have in your vocabulary. The other, the other uh, task, the, the other objective they are trying to optimize at the end, because that's uh, what a machine learning model does. You put an objective and you try to optimize that objective. You go like a loss function, you try to minimize this loss function. And this loss function is based on this objective, what, is, what you're trying to learn. And the second objective is two sentences given, and you try to, to tell if they are consecutive, if they are one after the other. So to do this, you can take two sentences from text, and then it does a positive instance, and to generate a negative instance, you take a sentence, and the second sentence is randomly selected, for instance. So all of this you can do easily with uh, on label data sets, Wikipedia, that is a lot of data, and the end, these deep learning models need a lot of data to learn representative uh, models. So this is the objective of this and what means being unsupervised. Now, contextual embeddings. I don't know if any here has any experience with word embeddings, word to back, uh, with natural language processing. What's what I was talking about? You have a word, like for instance, bank, and you have a vector representation of that word, numbers. These numbers changed while you were training your neural network. At the end, these are uh, weights of a neural network that change according to your training. Using back propagation, you do back propagation, you change these numbers, you do another instance or another forward propagation, compute the loss, back propagation, modify these weights, and so on. So you learn a vectorial representation that are numbers related to a, to a word. What means each dimension of this vector? Right now, in, in, ne in neural networks, really doesn't have any meaning. But the rationale of these uh, models that you represent a word as they mentioned, it started with some meaning. For instance, if you have a share and you extract features of that share, you can see the color, the material, the height, the width, several features, and each one of these features will be one of these weights. In a neural network, you put like a 300, and those 300 really don't have a meaning. At least a person cannot give you exact meaning, but you can correlate them to be features of the world, like a, you would do in a, a traditional classification where you have one object and you have features of that object. Now, there are models that are called like word to back that was pretty famous as well, uh, uh, presented by Google, and GLOV, that is Global Vectors, that used to get these representations for the, for the world. But one of the problems that I have is this world has several meanings. Bank could be a bench, could be a, something like a sandbank, could be a financial institution, and you only have one single representation of this word, one vector representation of the word that will try to average the meaning of the three meaning of this word bank. That sometimes is a problem. So this bird has some its model is capable of give give you different representation of this word bank uh, depending on its context. We have different vectors for, for the word depending the context is appeared. Word to back and glove, they also take, there are two context words uh, related here. These models, all of them are trained 
on context as well. You have a world, and they, given the concept, the context, they try to predict the world, but then you just get a fixed representation for that world. Verbs is capable of, is use, using context as well. It's given a sentence. You're taking context of the mask words. But then you can even change these vectors inside the word, inside the sentence you're trying to, to use for your particular problem. Well, this is very a lot of natural language processing, but uh, the idea is that uh, this bird may have different representation for a word that has several meanings. If you wanted to do this with this word to be, you would have to represent this bank dot one for the meaning of bank financial institution, bank dot two for the bank in this river bank context. So this is one advantage of bird as well. Task oriented fine tuning. So, how can you use this model for a particular task, for a classifier, for instance, to compute similarity between two sentences? Because this was trained on a supervised uh, um, data set. And now you want to apply this to a supervised data you have. For instance, email spam classification. Emails are the end, they are, uh, they are like, uh, sentences, and then you have a class, spam, not spam. So you will try to represent this sentence as a, as a vector and then apply classifier, a traditional classifier, it could be logistic regression, could be a multi perception neural network and so on, and then you have a class. So what you do is you transform this to verb and you put a classifier on top of verb and you have a traditional classifier where you are using its pre-trained data because this was pre-trained on Wikipedia so it has some representation for each word, you will try to combine them and have one single representation using word, and then you put another classifier that will use that representation and the labels you have to do the classification. So that's how you do kind of transfer learning. You use this pre-trained model and you apply for your particular task, you can do that. And they, they show how to do that in their code or in the papers as well. So, this uh, state of the art wire range of NLP, where these verbs have <coughs> been used, or have been used in this uh, sentence level task, it means you have only one sentence and you need to give just one class. For instance, sentiment classification. This SS2, SST2, is a data set on sentiment classification where you have to do binary classification, you are giving a a movie review, and you need to tell them if it is a positive review or negative review. And everything that related to, to that kind of task, this uh, model is quite good. And this is one of the benchmark data sets where they evaluated themselves and they got state of the art, a state of the art results. There are sentence level tasks. There are also sentence per level tasks, like multi, -langu multi natural language inference. There are some tasks like paraphrase identification where you are giving two sentences and you need to tell them if they have the same meaning or the other task like uh, this data set represents is the textual entertainment task you are giving two sentences and you need to tell if the second sentence is a consequence of the first sentence this model was used there in that kind of task and also gave state of the art results and there are also world level Task like a name entity recognition, you have a sentence and you need to tell uh, what part of a speech is each word in that sentence. Like if it is a noun, if it is a verb, what type of the tense of the verb, and so on. A pronoun. Uh, what is it? No, that's uh, some. That's part of part of a speech tagging that was used there too. And this is name entity recognition. is more like a, you have a sentence and you need to tell if one part of that sentence represents an entity, like for instance, company name, a person's name, uh, institution, and so on. Yeah, I confuse this. This is a name, entity recognition, but it was also used as part of a speech tagging. And there is a span level <coughs> tasks, like uh, this is a Stanford question answering data set. Is a question answering data set. You are giving a question, and you are giving a paragraph, and you need to tell from which, uh, which part of that paragraph uh, answer that question. All of these data sets are like a benchmark. Every single person today doing NLP on these areas 
basically needs to, to evaluate on, on this data set. It's like a benchmark in the academia. And they, of course, achieve state of the art results in all of these data, in, uh, data sets. Now I'm going to talk about what is the architecture of this, of this bird. So, what is the input representation? At the end, you need to represent the sentence as uh, numbers, as vectors, something that like you can work with. So, for that, they compute something that they call world peace vocabulary. And BERT, in one of the pre-trained models they provide, you can do low, they give you a, a fixed vocabulary of 30,000 uh, words. One of the main problems other models had is this kind of language representation. They will train this, Google will train this for two months in a lot of computers, nobody has except Google uh, for in a huge data set, and they will get some language model. Language model meaning representation, uh, representation of the words. But the problem they had, they had a fixed data set, let's say 100,000 words, but sometimes for your particular task, that word was not found in the data set. So what you had to do was initialize the representation of that unknown word randomly, some dis normal distribution from uh, 0 0.25 to minus 0 0.25, something like that. And that was a problem because for some particular task there were so many unknown words that this language model you were trying to use wasn't that good. So these people at Google, again, tried to use this approach that is called word piece, where you are, you will try to represent every single word in the universe in these 30k pieces. This, how, how they do that, for instance, they have banking here. If that word is not in the data set, they will try to divide it into smaller components. Bank and the ending ing. So bank is the start, the starting point of this word, and then the following part they put with this hash hash ing. And in the worst case scenario, they will represent a word as a single characters. Every character will be at the end in this vocabulary, every individual character. And in the worst case scenario where you cannot uh, divide this word into two or three components, it will represent represented as individual characters, and that's it. But you will always have one representation for a word, and this character will have some vectorial representation that was learned in the original Wikipedia dataset. So that's basically, I think, in my opinion, was one of the main contributions of this model, using this kind of a tokenization. Then, each token is a, a sum of three embeddings. They have the token embedding, that is, each one of these things in the vocabulary has a, a vector representation. At the beginning of the, the training part is randomly uh, initialized. And then they have something they call segment embeddings, because you might have in your model two sentences, if you are doing sentence, a sentence per task. So you have two sentences that will be fed to the model at the same time. So you have this segment embedding that will uh, tell you which part is the first sentence and which part is the second sentence. And then they have a position embedding, which is like an enumeration of the tokens, how they, how they appear to take into account also the order of these tokens. Then they use the transformer architecture. I'm not going to talk too much about here because it's a lot of boxes that are probably difficult to see. But this is basically the architecture they are based on. It's a transformer that is basically based on a neural network, deep learning, that is like a self-attention. We're going to talk about a bit more what is the attention mechanism. And then some like a residual connection, uh, normalization, then some feedforward, like I, people have used neural network, just multilayer perceptions, and so on. And there are a lot of things. They have an encoded <coughs> part, we said the coded part, and they, they stack plenty of these blocks on top of each other because that's what they like to do at Google. They have 300 million parameters that probably in academia you cannot do because you need like a 16 TPUs uh, training for two weeks. So that will cost you $200,000 just to do one round. So probably Google is the only one can do that for now, or Facebook too. So this is a very complex model, but it's basically this is a transformer model that is divided into an encoder and decoder. BERT only uses the encoder part. 
That's why it's called from encoders from transformer. So we're going to talk about a bit more about this encoder part only. That is, you have words, and these words have uh, embeddings that are the segment embedding and the, the word embeddings. And also you have the positional embedding of how these words appear. So you just sound them, you apply this self-attention mechanism, and then you pass this input, skipping the self-attention, and you do a summation between this original input with the output of self-attention, and you normalize. That's, that's called in deep learning residual networks, and they are very useful in deep architecture, where you have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, blocks, and you might have problems of vanishing gradient, because all of this is based on backpropagation and uh, these derivatives. So when you have very long or very deep architecture, you have a problem called vanishing gradient or exploiting gradients. And these, these kind of connections, they are helpful to prevent that. This is very like a deep learning, deep learning uh, concepts. So basically this is the encoder. And then after this layer, they put two linear linear projections that are basically multilayer perceptions with the same size of output as input and then they do also a residual connection here and so on and they do this six times six times one on top of the other so it's a very very complex model if you see the pre-trained model they have three four three hundred and forty million parameters they need to learn so this you need a huge um, architecture, a huge infrastructure to train this because it's very time consuming. But now we're going to talk about a bit what is self-attention here because it's one of the main uh, also parts of this of this model. It's model based on a paper that is called All You Need Is Attention. And we're going to talk about what is the motivation of attention, for instance. There are some models that are called sequence to sequence, some recurrent neural network that are called sequence to sequence. You, you, are, you are given a sequence and you need to generate the next sequence. Like for instance, machine translation. When you are translating, you are given an English sentence and then you want to have a French, a French sentence. There are some architectures, especially for this sequence of data, quite useful that are called the current neural network. Like a, a sequence models that will give you a representation of a sentence and given that representation we generate the next sentence. These uh, RNNs are quite useful for this kind of, of data that is uh, sequential like text which is sequential as well. But this model has a, a drawback. You get for instance an, L an LSTM, a long short term memory and you are giving these are input words. Imagine this is a sentence. This first word, second word, third word. In these models, you feed the first word and you use the weight of the LSTM and you give an output here, the, the state of this, uh, of this LSTM cell. And then you use this output and then the next word to generate another representation and so on. And then you get at the end of the sentence and you have a final representation for this sentence. Then, starting from there, you use another architecture, another LSTM, to generate the French sentence. The problem here is you are using just the last representation of the sentence, and you, might, you may have lose the dependencies between the, the words at the beginning. There are some long dependencies that LSTM still has some problems. LSTM was good for sequential uh, data, but when there were too long dependency between words, like uh, phrasal verbs with something in the middle, it had problems catching this uh, dependency between words in the, uh, la uh, long distances because you are using just the last part and not this. So they propose the attention mechanism. The attention mechanism is you have the same encoder decoder architecture, one LSTM, the other LSTM. But besides using the output of just one, you're going to use the output of every input, uh, input uh, feature you have, every word, use, uh, passing through another architecture, another, um, another multilayer perception. So this uh, model here will take 
and give a probability of which war will influence the next war here. And then to generate the next war, you use the first war, and all of this with the probability of which war is more needed. So that, that's the, the, the rush, how, how attention works. And it's state-of-the-art uh, results using this kind of architectures. So how it looks, for instance, in a machine learning, a machine translation task, you have an English, you have an English uh, sentence and you have a French sentence, and the attention mechanism, as it's giving probabilities to the inputs to generate a given output, you can visualize. That is one of the main problems also of deep learning. It's difficult to visualize. Using attention, you can visualize which word of the English sentence have more probability to influence one word of the French sentence. In this case, as, as it is almost one-to-one -one translation, you, you can see that the, the lighter color are in the diagonal, meaning that a noted is most probability for noted. Is that the word that most influence this other word here? That's uh, the, the attention mechanism, what it does. So there are different flavors and forms of the attention. This one I explained is the basic attention, but then uh, with the papers, you need to read like 20 papers to, to get to, to the last point. Is from attention, there was generalized attention, there was a slightly different representation on how you do this part here, how you do this network here, this is a network. How you do that could be the basic, just a multilayer perceptron, there are other ways to, uh, to represent, and they call that generalized attention. Then there's the self-attention. In this case, we have a sentence in English and we're trying to generate a sentence in French. But there are some tasks you need to attend the same sentence. You have an English sentence and you have to attend the same word. Like you have one word in the context is more influenced by other words and so on. That's, that kind of things, instead of having two sentences, you have just one and they apply attention that is called self-attention. And Then there is the multi-head attention that is applying the self-attention several times in, se in several heads and then concatenating them. That's multi-head attention. And then, after all of that, you get the transformer that is the one used in this bird model. So this is the transformer at, uh, at the end. This, uh, here is called self-attention, but it's also multi-head attention when you apply this several times. That is what, what, they, what they do. So <clears throat> an abstract architecture of how you use this model is, here. for instance, you have a task, and you, and you have like a, a mask sentence, the first sentence you saw, and you mask some tokens there. Then you have another sentence, you mask some tokens there, and you will try to learn the representation for those mask tokens. You are trying to, to predict those tokens. And then the output is like this. You have a, one output for each input token. When you want to use a classifier, you just put a, a multi-layer perceptron here. When you, use, you want to do like a name entity recognition, you use every single output for every single input. If you want to use contextual word embedding, you also use every output of every input, and so on. This is the way you train, this is the way you use this pre-trained model <coughs> into a, find a, a particular task you are, interest, you are interested in. Use this, you know, in, for instance, you want to do question answering, you have a, the question here and you have the paragraph here from you need to take the answer from. And then you present it all together, concatenated, you feed this to BERT and you will have some representation when you use the last n output of that representation. And so on, it's, it's quite simple to use. My recommendation, if you want to learn this, it's better to, to study the code, then it's going to be a bit more complicated. But uh, that way you will see how it really works. Because there is a huge difference between theory, what you see in the paper, and what you see in the code. There are some tricks, how they want to do the uh, word embeddings, how to do the, the layers of attention, there are a lot of tricks how they do that, with uh, reshaping a matrix, uh, representing the matrix concatenated and then breaking it apart again, and so on. It's quite useful to do the kind of study, to study the code that will tell you exactly how the paper is working. You will understand the concept of the paper. And uh, well, how to use is, first, the, the simplest way is to load 
one of the pre-trained embeddings Google provides. You can go to the GitHub repository and there are going to be links <coughs> to load these kind of models. And there are different models. There are like something they call very large. There are more layers, more parameters to learn in the, in the network. But they have like 24 layers. They have 124 hidden sites, each one of these layers. They have 16 attention heads. And in total, you have like 340 million parameters in your neural network. And you have cases like that. When you use case or on case, I mean, you use uh, words or lower case or word keeping the capital letters and so on. So they, they have different versions, case and on case. There is something here called whole, ma whole word, uh, word masking. Remember when we do this word piece tokenization where you break down one word that is not in the vocabulary into smaller components that are in the vocabulary. This, the first masking they were doing, they were just uh, kind of masking 15% of these tokens. But sometimes you will mask one part of the word and the other part not. In a word that was break, uh, in a word that was broken into three parts, for instance, you may on, uh, end up masking just one word. In the last approach, in the last uh, model they presented here, they put uh, an approach that you cannot do that. You will just mask the three parts of a given word. This is just technical part of these models they they do. So if you want to use this model first, you do load one of these pre-trained models they have, they, they see even one from, for Chinese. And uh, then you see what is your task, and you just represent your input in this way. If you have, for instance, in our case, we are doing similarity between textual part of two bug reports, two sentences, <coughs> like uh, the subject of two bugs. We just put one subject here, the other subject here, and then you have the a multi-layer perception in the first token of the sentence, that is this CLS, is a special token you put at the beginning of, of the sequence representation. And then you just put the multi-layer perception here and you get the classifier. You train this in your particular data set and everybody happy. That's the easy way to, to use, basically, in the code, when you have to code this, you basically need to create a class that will read then your data set and represent it in, in the way they, they want it to, to be. And it's, it's not difficult, you can, in the code they provide, there are examples for single sentence tasks, for pair of sentence tasks like the one we have. You can reuse this code and change it to, to your particular data set. This is quite simple in, the, in that uh, regard. And there are, well, it's basically that what you need to do to, to use it. And there are different, like a single, sentence tasks, question answering tasks, and, and so on. It, it's simple to use, but it's very good exercise to know how it works deep and inside. If you want to work on this, and then you want to propose a simpler approach of this bird, that there are already a lot of papers on simpler approach. There is another model from Facebook that is called Roberta. They just put Roberta, and they are based on this. So BERT's Google, Facebook created their own using this model, but it made it simpler and uh, more optimized, like you can do training faster. And there are a lot of work on this. I mean, NVIDIA is working hard to make their uh, uh, GPUs able to run this model faster, for instance, and things like that. So this is a, a lot of effort here. You will see a lot of uh, companies putting a lot of money and effort in, in this area, and um, we are using it too. So some reference, that these are only a few because there are thousands of references on this, but the main one is this, BERT, pre-training the uh, direction transformer for language understanding. This is the main paper of BERT. But this model is based on the transformer. The transformer is introduced in this paper as attention is all you need. These two, Google, both of them, and there's some tutorials that will teach you how, how it works in a simpler way because it's very complex. So you need to, to read this paper 10 times, to watch this tutorial 10 times, then to go to the code, see this code 10 times, and then you might have a better understanding how it works because it's very long. This is also the main, this is the, the main repository of BERT for TensorFlow, that is Google uh, Tools for Deep Learning. So here this code is in TensorFlow, but uh, here you will also find some links 
to some uh, implementation in PyTorch, for instance. And this, at the end, there are more like uh, tutorials how this uh, how this model works. If any of you is interested in NLP and uh, deep learning, you will find this quite useful. And if you are doing thesis on that, you will have to add this to your state of the art studies for sure. So, how to join Oracle? Well, what we are looking at Oracle is like a strong coding. There's uh, some requirement that sometimes academia likes a bit. Uh, we need people who know how to code because you cannot use plenty of these things and use 10 Python uh, for loops instead of doing a well vectorized model using NumPy, for instance, that does everything in just one magic multiplication. So we need people with a strong uh, coding skills foremost because we need to code this in an efficient manner. This is to be running a service that is easily scaled and that works fast and uh, people who come after you might understand. And also well, abilities for very difficult problems. Myself, I'm working on these deep learning approaches, but I'm also working on traditional machine learning using register regression, uh, traditional natural language processing using TF-IDF and uh, back of world uh, uh, approaches. We are using also CNNs and more deep learning. But sometimes uh, I've been using lately, for instance, like a longest common subsequence that is a traditional computer science uh, algorithm to find uh, two sequences that repeat in two sequences of uh, elements. So sometimes you need the uh, ability to solve very difficult problems and when we are hiring and doing interviews, we're going to ask simple problems like that to see how well you do solving uh, problems, how, how your, your brain works. Uh, well, some technical degrees would be computer science, electrical engineering, physics, math, uh, something like that. It's always welcome. For sure, it's uh, fluent written and spoken English. Every, I mean, one of the advantages of uh, Oracle here in Mexico is Oracle has three development centers. There is one in California, there is one in the India, and there is one in Mexico. There are only three developer centers. So we do products, new products, new things at Oracle Guadalajara. But usually, it's not just a team in Guadalajara. It's a half the team here, half the team in California, sometimes half the team in in India, so you have to speak English for sure. And uh, well, these strong grades or experience, sometimes you lack a bit of school, but you might have some experience or you, you try to study more. Of course, strong grades sometimes is, is good, good to have. And more proactive, goal oriented focus who wants to, to become specialists because you need to learn constantly. I mean, <coughs> this bird model I didn't know when I left, I just heard about it when I finished my PhD. So I had to study all this all the time. You need to attend conferences, you need to attend some seminars uh, at um, Oracle. Oracle sometimes also pays for Coursera courses if you need to take, like this uh, Andrew NG deep learning uh, course, uh, and so on. And well, at the end, what we want is employees. We don't have uh, outsourcing or anything. We want employees, we will have full benefit. Uh, health insurance, full salary, we will be uh, based in uh, our campus that is going to be quite new. Next year going to be there, so I don't know if uh, Dulce wants to add something, he's from Human Resources, so she, may, she will know. So, thank you very much, Miguel. Yes, uh, my name is Dulce, I'm part of the recruitment and selection team. Actually, um, well, this is like the most important um, qualifications that we are looking for. But besides that, we really want to have people that enjoy coding. Uh, we want to find people that feel passionate about everything that's related to programming because we want to, for you to pursue and keep doing the things that you enjoy doing at most. So this is uh, the most important qualifications. One of the things, like uh, Miguel said, that I really loved about Oracle is if the, since, since the beginning, we can uh, see that you are a very talented person. Oracle really encourage you to uh, do new things, to try uh, new things, you can take some courses. The most of our benefits are beyond law and it is like a very competitive related to the market. So if you are interested in coding or in programming languages, doesn't really matter which one. Uh, if you like uh, Java or Python, we really encourage you to apply to our positions. 
And if you are going to live in Guadalajara, uh, we, you already saw the campus, it's pretty great. We are moving, I, I think, on the next year, right? Uh, by the end of this, but uh, there's always some <laughs> delays because government permits and so on. But uh, they say the latest by the end of the next year because the next month, at least my floor, is uh, very rented to another company. So we have to go away, work from home, or, or something, but uh, next month, uh, December, is already ready to another company, so next year we have to be there at 4 o'clock, we have to, well, I would go work from home from Cancun or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that day they allowed me to do sometimes. So this is like the ideal scenario, but if you are currently studying, uh, the most important thing is that you are interested in joining Oracle. On the other hand, we can work on that, or we can review uh, in which kind of position your profile works best. So if you're interested, you can always feel free to reach me out or Miguel, uh, but this is like the most important qualifications for the positions that we are hiring. Uh, well, that's it. There's some uh, point of contacts. If you want to, want to contact one of the recruiting team at the end, and these, uh, if you want to take a test, and then be interviewed by someone, you can go to this link and, uh, and apply, you will get some basic computer science uh, problems and then you might be interviewed. There are opportunities for people who are in the last semesters to do in, uh, internships uh, as part of Oracle. We have some talks with UNAM as well, with the EMAS, to promote them to go and do a project at Oracle and they will do the graduation with this project. So instead of a thesis, they will do a project at, at Oracle. And they will have to write just a thesis of 20, 20 pages instead of an entire full, full manuscript. So, I mean, actually in my case, I did an internship at Oracle when, while I was doing my PhD. I was the second year of my PhD and I did an internship for six months. And that's why I got the job. I mean, I didn't even apply for an interview after the, after the internship. Two years later, I finished my PhD, and uh, Eric Peterson called me, that is a, a managing director of Oracle Mexico, in Zapopan. He called me, why are you doing what you finish? You want to come? Yes, and I end up with the same team at the end, with the same project I worked four years ago. So I encourage you sometimes uh, having a real life experience help you to, to see how, how the industry behaves and give you um, good experience how to work machine learning with the real world data. So basically, I don't know if you take a picture of it, but that's it. So I will put this back. Miren, yo les propongo, si quieren, hay como una, dos componentes, una la parte de investigación y otra la parte más de interés y reclutamiento en la empresa. Si gustan, la primera parte, digamos un par de preguntas, una exposición larga, más larga de la que usualmente tenemos. Si gustan, dedicamos algunas preguntas a la parte más de investigación y en una siguiente parte, pues ya los interesados ya lo pueden hacer ya sea en corto o también de manera abierta. Entonces, quieren ahorita en esta primera parte preguntas de investigación, en español y en inglés, como prefieran. Entonces, este, pues, adelante. No sé si tengo una. No sé cómo estamos. ¿Cómo qué? <risa> Mira, me llama mucho la atención eh, que el bug lo busquen en los reportes del bug y no en el código. Porque el lenguaje de programación pues, es algo más simple, es muy sencillo que los lenguajes de programación. Entonces, que aplique las técnicas al reporte, a la, a, a, también a los archivos de log del sistema. Entonces, que indica que el, eh, no hay una relación a uno a uno entre el código y el problema. Puede producirte distintos códigos sin ningún problema. Eso es complicado de responder porque la well, the database is a huge system, has like a thousands of lines of code, and uh, has a lot of um, configurations. So there might be a lot of different configurations that may have caused the, the problem. We do take into account, for instance, the stack trace. When something breaks, give you a, a trace 
of what broke in which function, then the function that called that function, and so on. So in that sense, we are using the code. And we have some other approach where we try to like, uh, correlate a file of uh, traces. I mean, this code is generating traces in some file. And this file, we analyze it and try to correlate this to part of code. But I mean, the code is also changing a lot, so sometimes it's not the same line number. It is, it's very complicated. And I mean, this uh, one bug, if you're related to the database, and depending on uh, how much traces that you are generating, you might have gigabytes of information, gigabytes of traces with memory dumps, with a, like a more like an ensembler in uh, assembly, ensembler of assembly, yes. assembly code, because this code is transformed to assembly at some point, and in one of these traces, sometimes you have assembly code, so you need to do a lot of uh, manual inspection of this assembly code looks like this part of the code. There are some people that does that manually. Do it automatically is a big challenge. That's a problem in the industry. You have to to have a lot of data and make sense of that data, make a subset of that data, so do some parsers that we, for instance, remove the the memory dumps that for some particular case might be useful, but most of the time might not be useful because it's not generic. The memory dump is just for a particular computer where it was run. So it's a... Uh, it's very complicated, and, and the, the system of Oracle, uh, the database is like huge. So yes, it's quite important to look this correlation between the bug and the code, because at the end, the code is the, is the one that generated the bug. So we use part of it. We use the stack trace. For instance, this stack trace is when you, you break something and say, this function, this file, then the other function, this file, the other function, this file. But you might have Java code. C++ okay. code, C code, Python code, Perl code is okay. is a lot, is a lot. But I mean, in the in the bug report, there is that information as well. There is the information about the version of the database, the stack trace, which traces are generated, uh, and so on. And I have a second question: Is that uh, how about how you are sure that the models with I think this all generated automatically? How these automatically uh, models? Are correct models. Evaluate, yes. Uh -huh. well, we have a feedback from the developers. At the end, this is something that, that we're evaluating, for instance, two, three months. I mean, we have our data set, we divide our data, we split our data set, uh, like a training, cross validation test. But in real life, when we are using these models, after two months, you get, you review the predictions you did two months before, okay. and you see if this bug were labeled manually by an engineer as a duplicate. Okay. So that's the feedback you get. That's the feedback you get, like uh, you did the prediction right. You see that one, two, three months later. So After the work is closed. with the automatic system and you continue Well, we, we generate data set <coughs> at some point. We generate a model, a, a <coughs> stateful model. And then we use this model for several months. And then sometimes we might retrain this model. Okay. It's not uh, like uh, this. Um, I forgot the name. This uh, you are constantly changing the model. Okay. It's like, uh, well, I'm blocked now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, we just generate the model, and after a few months, we generate a new model. Okay. Okay. It's not like a. Wow, what is the name? kind of models you are training constantly all the time, uh, live. They got a name for that. I forgot. Um, no, we generate the model before, and. Uh, then we evaluate like that with, with that kind of feedback. We, we do some prediction and after a few months after the bug is closed, we see if the bug was labeled uh, duplicate, then you get feedback there. And sometimes you get more informal feedback from developer. Oh yeah, this tool is good, uh, it helped me fix this problem and so on. But the way to, to evaluate the model is, is that way. Because at the end this is a real problem. So after sometimes a month you will see how it was fixed and it was labeled duplicate or not. So you will get the, this feedback. Alguna otra pregunta? Comentario? Y yo quisiera preguntar, es decir, entiendo que el trabajo que, que tienes y todo tu equipo es identificar los problemas similares que se puedan presentar. Pero entonces digamos aquí, pareciera que este es el punto de nunca acabar. Digamos, como que es, es un problema que está siempre presente y quizá, no lo sé, y esa, y esa es parte de la pregunta, si hay, digamos, algunos problemas como 
frecuentes que se presentan y que los tienen bien identificados y que en ese sentido, al tenerlos bien identificados, fácilmente ustedes pueden decir este problema es similar o el mismo que se nos presentó antes en tal lugar y a partir de ahí pues agilizan la solución el que ese problema pueda tratarse de una manera eficiente pero parecía, y, en, y entonces bueno, pues la disminución en costos, que es una cosa fundamental, eh, disminuye. Pero pareciera que es como, bueno, ese lo tenemos caracterizado, pero claro, habiendo tantos usuarios sobre tantos dominios en el mundo, como que es algo que siempre va a haber. Entonces, digamos, ¿es, es cierta mi apreciación? ¿O en realidad si sí hay una tendencia a disminuir, aunque sea de manera digamos, asintótica, los problemas que tienen, y por lo tanto también el costo pues, disminuye asintóticamente, o en realidad el costo, el gasto que tiene que asumir ahora aquí, por lo que se presenta, más o menos se mantiene siempre. Es una pregunta muy question especialmente en la parte de las expensas, porque lo que get for that question is that one point would be that uh, you have plenty of problems. Now you get the model that tells you when it's a duplicate, so you don't report a bug. So you will decrease the number of duplicate, uh, duplicate bug reported, because people already know this is a duplicate, so they don't submit it anymore. Sometimes you can do that. You, before submitting the bug, you use the model, and it tells you if it is duplicate, then you don't submit it. So the number of duplicate bugs will go down. But uh, another problem is Oracle is uh, constantly creating new products. So when you create a new product, there's a lot of problems that will arise at the beginning. So using this model will uh, save you a lot of time and money. But uh, getting this correlation, like uh, the, the price goes down, is difficult because there are plenty of factors, like uh, the new update, the new product. And also this model is sometimes trained with data of these different products. That does uh, relate a lot uh, in the way we create the data set to train our model how you create it, and that's a really, really complex part because the duplicate box you have already in the data set, in the, da in, in the database of box, you have them already labeled, but how you create the negative pair of box that not, they are not duplicate and you learn some minim meaningful representation from them is quite challenging. Uh, so to get that uh, representation, of the, I don't know if you mean the cost, the cost or the, the number of box, of the number of problems you're going to get once you use this model? I, I don't know exactly if you made that. No, no, eh, eh, yo creo que efectivamente si me, si me contestas lo que, digamos, mi pregunta. Es porque tú me dices, bueno, si tenemos una aplicación, ya lo caracterizamos los errores que tiene, que entonces ya sabemos cómo disminuirlo, incluso los usuarios ya saben, ¿no? Y que es el error tal, y entonces ya ni siquiera lo reportan, lo resuelven de manera local. Pero claro, ustedes desarrollan nuevas aplicaciones para dominios específicos que siempre surgirán nuevos y entonces ahí claro el problema puede presentarse y claro ahí la identificación es otra vez volver a la similitud ahora el costo que se les puede generar bueno, claro, es decir es tanto a nivel computacional a nivel eh, de lo que tú decías que a veces tienen que tiene que ver con la configuración correcta o no que ha hecho el usuario del equipo de la nueva aplicación eso también tiene un acuerdo de aprendizaje so, there are a lot of things uh, involved, but uh, what, what we're trying to do is precisely to tackle that. Once a new product comes or a new update comes, the model can be retrained and deployed. It's like you don't need to spend the same uh, time or money to train engineers to detect this. The model you train in the last 10 years data, for instance, uh, and uh, it will learn, that it, will, it will probably detect the new problems. Of course, if there are no problems already uh, in the data set uh, duplicated, uh, labeled as duplicate, then how you can learn that? That's very tricky. Or this is not the only uh, tool Oracle uses. Oracle uses a lot of uh, deterministic approaches as well, or some probabilistic approaches as well, to get a, a set of symptoms of a problem and give you a possible solution or possible uh, developer to, to solve this. I mean, Oracle has a lot of tools to, to try to, to triage a, a bug.
how to solve the map. So it's not just this model. Y más o menos tiene caracterizado, digamos, como cuál es la probabilidad de surgimiento de error que tenga con una nueva herramienta que ustedes, con un nuevo producto que ustedes desarrollen. Más o menos ya dicen, bueno, ya sabemos que para un nuevo producto nosotros se nos van a presentar esta cantidad de demandas, de problemas que pueda, que pueda tener el producto. Supongo que sí lo tendrán caracterizado. A menos yo no, no tengo esa, esa información. Tal vez mi jefe que lleva ya como 5 o 6 años trabajando ahí tenga más, más idea de cómo ha ido evolucionando el problema, las probabilidades, el feedback de los usuarios y les ha ayudado con una nueva aplicación. ¿no? Bueno, no sé si todos hablan español. O inglés. Ok, bueno, well, mi uh, my, my manager tiene como 5 años de trabajo ahí, así que tiene más información sobre how the learning curve has been going when new products arrived, how we managed to characterize these problems. Some products might be 60, 70, 80 percent uh, accuracy to find a duplicate or not. It's, it's very interesting to do this kind of a statistical analysis, but uh, I don't have it. I'm, at least not in my case. I've, I've been there just for one year. What, what we have seen is that the new product in the autonomous database there are a lot of duplicate things happening. I don't know the percentages, but there are a lot, because a lot of problems are submitted automatically. So if you have an autonomous database using Prime for another in London, they are submitting a lot of problems. So it could be like a 50% of the box, I remember that, like around 50% of the box submitted for the autonomous database are duplicate. So that's a huge cost for, for a company. Because it was, o sea, yo creo que matemáticamente pudiera haber una caracterización para los que hacen verificación formal. Pero, seguramente. Probablemente, y claro, pero luego hay distintos contextos, distintos dominios, distintos problemas específicos, que esos ya son los que, los que generan los problemas puntuales. We need uh, more scientists to do this kind of characterizations, for sure. I'm, I'm the only one with PhD here doing this kind of stories in this particular team, so yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I'm the only one PhD? Yes, in this team. Uh, so, but of course, this is something like a, the better the, pro, uh, the, the product gets, the more products we cover because we don't cover every product at Oracle, the more uh, money we get, more uh, budget we have to hire more professionals. In our team, we are uh, searching for another uh, machine learning engineer or scientist, like a master PhD, and we are also searching for engineers to do integration more like programming. I mean, at the end, we, we need people who knows how to program well. But we are looking for that. Here in Mexico, I think we hired just a new machine learning scientist in the US as well for our team to do some question answering, something like that. Okay. But yeah, these are analysis, like formal analysis, mathematical analysis. At least I don't have it. I mean, I, I got to this team and I'm bringing a lot of like a formal stories, like a, every time I do a approach, I do all the process of evaluation of a model, do the presentation, do, I could almost write a paper about it. So we need to, to bring more like a research, uh, rigorous approach to industry to document things uh, or experiments are, are done. That's why we need this collaboration between industry and academia as well. Okay, I don't know if there is other question or comment. If not, we can pass to the second part. Uh, so, ustedes pueden platicar con, con Dulce, con Miguel, si tienen interés en cómo poder integrarse a Oracle. Eh, y de momento, pues bueno, nosotros le damos un reconocimiento a Miguel Ángel de parte del de, eh, Departamento de Computación por tu brillante conferencia, Panel Picket Box at Oracle, y pues muy agradecido, o sea, muy interesante. Gracias, gracias. Y...